This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Is war with Iran coming? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my colleague, Reason Associate Editor Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Last Saturday, Iran launched hundreds of armed drones and missiles to attack Israel. The government says this is in retaliation for an airstrike on an Iranian consulate in Syria that killed seven members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, Israel reports that with the help of allies like the U.S. and the U.K., they intercepted most of the drones and the sole known casualty was a Bedouin girl critically injured by falling missile shrapnel. Israel has not retaliated yet. In the wake of all that, today's guest had something to say about the way some American activists loudly came to the defense of the Islamic Republic of Iran after staying conspicuously silent during the protests and crackdowns that began almost two years ago. Here's a bit of her viral video. We've had to watch over the past 24 hours people clambering onto the internet to exclaim that Iran has the right to defend itself. In what capacity have you distorted the story to make the Islamic Republic the victim? That, that's, that's, I think, what we're most curious about. When we were screaming for the past two years that they were lynching us, where were you? When we were screaming that they were killing Iranian women for not wearing a hijab, where were you? When they were lynching Iranian men from cranes for protesting, where were you? When we were explaining that this is a terrorist occupying force, where were you? But all of a sudden, everyone's graduated from Instagram school of law to say that this is a violation of international law and Iran has the right to defend itself. That was Elika Laban, a first-generation Iranian immigrant born in the UK and currently living in Los Angeles, where she practices law and runs several large social media accounts that bring attention to the plight of the Iranian people. Elika, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Let's reflect on that viral video. Um, what was it you were seeing in reaction to Iran's attack that made you think this message needed to get out there? Well, you know, it wasn't just what I had seen in that moment that made me think the message needed to be um, needed to get out there. It was something that had been building from October 7th. And um, myself, as well as other Iranians, um, had been doing a lot of work to kind of uh, counteract the mass disinformation that was being put out there. You know, you have accounts with millions and millions and millions of followers. This is kind of the pitfall of, of social media and our you know, contemporary um, way that we receive information. You know, you have count accounts with millions of followers and they literally just say anything. I mean, they really just say anything. And people are like, oh, well, if they said it, it must be true. So from October 7th, there was um, a buildup of this radicalization um, for supporting terrorist groups and terrorist regimes. Right from October 7th, I was nervous. I was nervous because I could see the way that this was going. I could see this whole freedom fighter rhetoric was going in a really dangerous direction. I could see this growing support for all of the regime's proxies, for the Houthis in the Red Sea, um, for Hamas, for Hezbollah, and um, this kind of uh, spinning of the narrative that, you know, we've been lied to and um, Iran, a.k.a. the Islamic Republic, are the good guys and China and Russia are the good guys and everyone's just fighting Western imperialism. I mean, this is just propaganda that we've the Iranian people have been debunking for 45 years. Hmm. So by the time it reached this limit that everyone, you know, was um, going on the Internet saying, um, Iran has the right to defend itself, completely having misunderstood this entire story. I actually didn't want to put out the message, if, if I'm being honest. I was really tired. I was exhausted. I actually just was like, I'm signing off. And everyone was like, no, you can't sign off. Um, we're relying on you. And um, I, I spoke to a friend and I just kind of voiced my concerns, everything that I'd said in the video. And he was like, um, 
just make that a video post it and i promise i promise it will go viral and i was like no mm. and he was like you must and then i did and it did so yeah can you think of a like give us a specific concrete example of the type of post you said these high follower posts that were putting out just a dead wrong message is there any example that comes to mind of something that you thought wow that's really a problem I mean, for, I mean, there's many that I can think of. I mean, I, I've seen so many videos. Um, it like just the craziest things, like people with millions of followers saying things like there was peace in the Middle East before 1948. What? Mm. Um, but actually, just about a week before um, I made this video where everything happened, there was a tweet from Bassem Youssef um, on. Uh, on Twitter, obviously a tweet's on Twitter, X, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, and he was quoting um, Explain who else. that is, please. Explain who Bassem Youssef is. Um, he's an Egyptian comedian. Um, um, I, I, that's who he is. <laughs> he's, on, uh, he's on Twitter. He, he's... Um, he had. Uh, he goes. He's a very well known. He's a very. He's he's huge. He. I've seen him compared to like the John Stewart of the Arab world. So he sort of outlasted his uh, prime. He's past his prime. <laughs> well, he's back. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, but yeah. Sorry, oh, no, continue. What did What did you see start from uh, Bassem? Okay, so Bassem has twelve million followers on on Twitter, and he had put up some tweet about how he was responding to somebody else and he put up some tweet uh, basically just making framing the uh, regime as the victim in the story like they were being um attacked and now that you're saying that there's a war you're saying that um you know they don't have the right to defend themselves this is just uh, you're a um sociopathic narcissist something just uh, some type of framing of them being uh you know the victims and the, re the Iranian community came out in droves and we asked him, please take this down, revoke it, correct what you've said. You're completely mistaken. You have no idea what you're talking about and you're going to cause us massive amount of harm. And then sure enough, everyone on TikTok and Twitter started saying that Iran is, is the victim. Iran has the right to defend itself. Do you think that this is sort of co-opted by the social justice progressives of the West? I mean, why would this narrative that Iran is the victim here be so persuasive, so compelling to people? Like explain that psychology or that thinking to us. So I think everybody has watched over the last couple of years, um, the progressive movement just really nosedive in, in, an, in an obvious way. Um, it's just the entire philosophy has become so reductive. So um, the, the, they've created this binary, this false dichotomy of oppressed and oppressor, where everyone in the oppressed camp is good. And if you're suffering, you're a good person and they glamorize and glorify suffering and oppression and they want to appropriate it and they want to um, become those things and they want to wear the costumes. Um, and if you're the oppressor, which is usually anything associated with, with the West, you're bad and you have to die. So um, in the context of Iran, <clears throat> you'd think that they'd be, you'd be like, okay, good. So you, you agree that the Iranian people are the oppressed in this narrative and in your little oppressor oppressed binary, you want to stand with the people of Iran, correct? No, it's an actual fact. It's the Islamic Republic that are the victims of Western imperialism, but they can't give you any example of Western imperialism in Iran in the past 45 years that the Islamic Republic has been there because it's never happened. Everything that they make up in their heads is just a fantasy. But wouldn't they be pointing to something prior to the last 45 years? I'm not saying that the, the narrative is correct, but I would imagine they're pointing to something that happened before that, no? Yeah, I mean, they're talking about they're talking about many things that happened um, prior to 1945. Yes, they want to bring up uh, Mossadegh, the coup, CIA, uh, all of this stuff. Um, it's just completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant to anything that's uh, been happening in the last couple of decades. Well, yeah, we and we we want to talk a little bit about all that deep history later in the conversation with Mossadegh, but um, I did want to, you know, to bring it back to closer to present day. Um, we in the introduction, I mentioned that I believe you became really active after the protest movement that started a couple years ago. 
Um, could you just, uh, before we get to the roots of that movement, could you just tell me a little bit about your personal history, like getting involved with this as as an activist, uh, specifically, you know, your your social media accounts, what inspired you to start speaking out about what, what you saw as kind of a flawed analysis from Westerners? Yeah, so I mean, the um, uh, revolution kicked off um, September 2022. That's when a young a Kurdish woman, Gina Amini, Massa Gina Amini, was killed. And that obviously we know that kind of sparked a revolution um, both inside Iran and outside Iran. Um, so what was really crucial about our work as Iranian activists was that um, we had long understood that there was this pattern with the regime where um, people who were made famous in some way in international media, um, the regime would not execute them because they didn't want to have more um, upheaval. So we noticed this pattern even a couple of years before that in 2020, when a couple of young men were put on death row for um, protesting gas prices. It was kind of during the COVID um, era. Um, so that got a lot of media attention. Their death sentence was eventually commuted, um, I think, to like 100 years and then reduced to five years finally, maybe even three in the end. So we've, we've, we've long noticed this pattern of the regime doing that. So <clears throat> when this revolution kicked off in 2022, um, they were arresting a lot of protesters. Um, so what we would do is we would use our social media platforms to highlight who these people were, the fact that they had been um, detained, uh, even like um, big singers like Shervin Hajipur, who actually ended up winning a Grammy recently. Um, and uh, I started this campaign that was called Say Their Names to Save Their Lives. It was like a hashtag. Mm -hmm. So um, I would, and then obviously it wasn't just me, ma many of us. Um, but I would put up, uh, introduce information about these activists um, and ask people to just use the hashtags to say their names. And uh, we actually, I mean, it, it kind of worked, you know, a lot of the time people were either released or they were taken off of death row. So we were using social media to kind of bring attention to their accounts. Um, at the same time, what we were working against was the um, a lot of the radical leftists, um, or you know what one would pejoratively describe as the tankies um, that would say that this is atrocity propaganda. None of this is really happening. It's all a lie. It's just um, uh, a propaganda to go to war with Iran. So we've been dealing with these people for a long time. Was that surprising to you to encounter that, or had you seen that kind of contingent before? It's just. It's just baseless conspiracy theories that, that that's the thing um they have this one uh, they have this one mode you know in farsi we say yeah and there means you have one gear their one gear is noam chomsky manufactured consent and they apply it to absolutely everything that they come across they, they cannot even fathom the fact that do you not think that maybe the people inside iran just want to get rid of the the uh, uh, oppressive regime that are lynching them from cranes. Why is that so hard for you to accept? Yeah, there's a real uh, kind of theft of agency there. The idea that the U.S. is always and everywhere pulling the strings that I think that a lot of uh, kind of interventions, military intervention skeptics fall prey to. And I, and I count myself within that group, by the way, I think that the U that U S foreign policy needs to be, you know, radically changed. Um, but I have definitely seen people in what I would consider more or less my camp fall prey to that. I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, you mentioned this say their names campaign um, and like the power of the individual in the social media age is is really a, a big change from past revolutions. Um, and this uh, figure who you mentioned kicked off the revolution, uh, Masa Amini, is uh, it, it seems like it was, it was really what happened to her that kicked a lot of this off. Could you just tell us who was Masa Amini and what happened to her and why did the people of Iran respond this way? 
Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, she was a young, um, you know, 22-year-old Kurdish woman. Um, she was in uh, Tehran visiting. Um, she was she was wearing a headscarf. In fact, she wasn't not she wasn't just going around walking around without a headscarf. Um, but they said that she was inappropriately wearing the headscarf that some of the strands of her hair were showing. Um, they took her in. Uh, they detained her. They took her into detention. Um, and while she was in the interrogation room, people said that they started hearing screaming um, that she and she was knocked over the head. Um, she was knocked unconscious and um, she, she was hospitalized and um, eventually uh, succumbed to her injuries. Um, I often describe the um, Massa Amini moment for Iran as uh, the George Floyd moment for America. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't the first time we'd seen this, obviously. It wasn't like, whoa, 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 what's this? You know, it was the final stick that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, so, so that's exactly what that was. It was just as in the USA where it was like, okay, enough. We've seen enough of this. Um, now, now we're done. And then it just kicked off like a domestic and global revolution. This is exactly what happened with Massa Amini. It was like, you've killed us so many times for this. This, this is the final stick that brought the ca uh, broke the camel's back. And it kicked off the, the revolution. The Islamic Republic had a very different account of what went down. It seems that almost nobody bought their account. Can you explain just to our audience that might not be familiar with Massa's case, what their sort of counter narrative was and whether or not this was persuasive to literally anybody. I mean, it's just, it's so funny. It's so funny to Iranians because they've been doing that this to us for our entire lives. They kill, they kill our families and come up with every excuse. Everyone fell off of a building. That, that, that's the best one. Like everyone was just casually walking and fell off a building. We don't know like how that happened. A young they, woman had a heart attack, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She had a heart condition from when she was like eight years old or something. And then just in that exact moment, something just happened to happen that <laughs> triggered her heart condition because she got nervous and suddenly died um it's it's just it's it's just it's so laughable it's not even worth mentioning there's also and, no and way to investigate that narrative right like it's not as if you can have this like no. autopsy and any sort of actual evidence that is established that lots of different parties that aren't affiliated with the government can have access to like in the united states we have a little bit more recourse on that front when it comes to a, a cop killing narrative um and you know allowing coroners uh to do different reports to see what actually went down and to attempt to get multiple opinions but in iran you have nothing like that no and that's that's really what um people in the west struggle to understand um and i sometimes refer to it as the privilege of trust you have this trust mm -hmm. that there are some democratic functions that allow you some access to some degree of truth obviously we know we have a lot of corruption here too it's not exactly perfect but you have to just even think of the chain of custody of these types of events the first, even the police report, the police report is going to be not persuasive to the person that's been harmed. OK, it, it's obviously in a different direction. The the coroner's report, the autopsy. And then um, you even have like when, when you're in court. Right. You don't have your own lawyer. You don't have access to your files. You have a regime appointed lawyer. You talk about the media. It's all um, all of Iran's state media is uh, under the control of of the supreme leader and so there's really no point in this chain of custody where you're going to have any access to any type of truth any type of transparency and that's why we say when we talk about people in in uh, prisoners in iran everyone for all intents and pur purposes is innocent because i mean this is the philosophy we have here right you're innocent until you're proven guilty and if you actually can never prove somebody guilty because you never have access to the evidence you never have access to a lawyer you never have access to you don't have a jury right you have one judge who also plays the prosecutor you don't have a right to present any evidence you never find out if anybody's guilty so if you can't prove that anybody's guilty that therefore we have to assume everyone's innocent because we'll never know but explain the role of the morality police also to western audiences who might not understand i mean walking around iran what is that experience like as a woman um well the morality police are there to keep an eye on on women and how they dress and um, whether they're wearing the hijab correctly or not. Um, there was one period of time where they had reported that the morality police had disbanded. Um, 
which was false, <laughs> right? Like that's totally. No, they had turned to, um, you know, more of the technology AI front. It's just, it's really funny to me because they just, hmm. uh, the Western media really just keeps proving um, how little they understand about these things, you know, when they say, you know, if, if the Islamic Republic said it, it must be true. If Hamas said it, it must be true. Um, just not understanding that these people really just say anything. They just say anything. There's literally no regulatory oversight. There is nobody checking for what they say. Um, so morality police did not disband. They um, actually have cameras where they catch women who are wearing um, not wearing hijab and they go after them or go after them they find them they go to their houses um, and they bring them in to be flogged can you talk about the i mean living under those police state totals it sounds like it's the surveillance has gotten pretty bad uh with the your you mentioned uh implement implementation what? like ai surveillance um like the difficulty of um, kind of speaking out because, you know, you're, you're a first generation immigrant, but for people who are lit, so you, you have the freedom living in this country to speak out and criticize the Islamic Republic. But, um, what is the reality for people there who it, like, and, and how, like, how do we even gauge there, if there's this count, if there's this counter narrative that, uh, you know, every the strings are all being pulled by the CIA or whatever, and people like you are just like puppets of the US, um, how would uh, a dissident in Iran actually speak out if they wanted to criticize the regime? Well, they can't. That's the whole point. They can't speak out. And that's what they're trying to do when they were protesting. But you can see their actions also as, as a form of expression of what their situation is. Right. When right. they're taking to the streets um, and risking their lives and not it's not just a risk. They, they are being killed. They're being shot. You're seeing these young Iranians, right, like pulled into vans and then nobody really knows. what exactly happens with And them. I'll just they're pull up this one this one data point from Amnesty International showing that uh, Iran executed 853 people in an eight-year high amid relentless repression and renewed, quote, war on drugs. So some of the, uh, a lot of those were uh, supposedly drug-related offenses. Many of them were not. Um, and th this is just like one data point to kind of convey to people the severity of the, the threats that people there are living under but yeah continue but they're not that. even necessarily um they're not even necessarily like they just accuse you of anything they accuse you of yeah. um Muharabe, which means wage, waging war against god um that some people that they've put on death row for being um lgbtq uh, mm -hmm. they don't say sometimes they say that sometimes that because it is actually um a crime punishable by death under Sharia law. So yeah, they can just say that. Sometimes they, for a couple of people, um, like um, uh, uh, Elham Shubdar, there were a few people that they accused them of being um, Jasus, which means spy. You know, they, they just come up with any charges and who's going to tell them that they're wrong, you know? So um, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought because I wanted to go back um, to, oh yeah, you know, they um, blind protesters in the eye. So there are many young protesters. They've actually, some of, a lot of them have um, left the country and they, they've taken out their eyes, right? You have the oil workers in Iran that were going on strike to sanction themselves, right? And so when people in the West say like, oh, you know, these sanctions are American propaganda and this, this, this. Well, then why are the Iranian people going on strike when they had they had three day strikes so many times throughout um the the protest the revolution period where every 100 percent of stores in iran in tehran were shut down if they're going on strike to starve out their own economy to, to take these people out how can you say that this is a cia operation why don't you just look at what they're doing if, if that's how they felt, they wouldn't be doing all of the, those things. They wouldn't be collapsing their own economy. They wouldn't be um, risking their own lives. They wouldn't be having their own eyes, like risking their eyes being taken out. It doesn't make no. any sense. Could you give us more detail about the oil worker strike? Like what exa when exactly did that happen? And, and you know, what sort of scale are we talking? And tell me about Oh, it was massive. Um, I don't know. Uh, it was either 
late 2022 or early 2023. This happened several times. In reaction to the Massa wave of protests. Um, no, it was it was an attempt to get the, the to get rid of the regime. That's okay. what they do all of this stuff for because yeah. that's what the regime relies on. That's the regime's number one source of um, income, by the mm -hmm. way, which they embezzle the money from the people and put it into their pockets. The um, supreme leader's worth something like upwards of a hundred billion, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, so they went on strike to try and um, starve the regime out that way because if they can't ha have access to these oil exports, that's really significantly. And that was because Biden was laxing on imposing the sanctions at the time, which was following on from the maximum pressure campaign. Um, uh, and then by, because Biden wasn't enforcing those sanctions, the oil exports in Iran had reached a five year high. Um, during this revolution period. And this, this is something that it's so frustrating because the Iranian people have to deal with this over and over and over again. The same thing happened um, during the Obama um, administration when there was a different revolution. It was the Green Movement. And um, they were on the brink of taking the regime out at that time. And um, Obama got into the nuclear deal with the uh, regime on unfreezing $150 billion to the regime. And they came back strong from that. They were empowered from that. And so you have the people on the ground paying the price for their freedom with their blood. And this is what is so frustrating when um, these the Western leftists say, oh, well, Iranian people can free themselves. Yeah, they can if you stop giving the mullahs money. Because every mm. time they've been so close to freeing themselves, you keep giving the mullahs mo money. And that's why I call them the Western imperialists, because imperialism, by definition, is um, interference or extending your own influence in a different country, either by military intervention or by diplomacy. And you keep doing diplomacy with this terrorist regime. That is your own form of Western imperialism, that you're keeping them in power when the people of, of Iran are paying the price with their blood, with their strikes, to get them out. Yeah, I, I want to talk more about the role of the U.S. in this uh, kind of near the close to the end of the conversation. But I, I would like to linger for a second on the what started in 2022 um, and compare it to the green revolution that you just brought up a second ago. This, in a sense, seems more enduring um, that they were able to kind of crush that. There's the factors you brought up, but also the fact that they were they really were able to shut down the Internet and communications back then. And it's been a little more, or I'd say much more resilient this time. And some aspect of that se seems to have to do with the way social media has evolved and the way that these messages spread. Uh, what what role would you say that has played in the endurance of the movement in Iran right now? I think it's all of it. Honestly, I think I think it all of it is. I mean, all is a strong word, but I think as a, a social media plays a huge, huge part of it. I mean, social media plays a huge part in almost every kind of foreign conflict that we're seeing now because people have a lot of exposure. Um, it's really difficult for people to be exposed constantly to these tragedy tragedies um war and this and that and just you know ignore it and go about their their lives and so people become invested um so i think social media played a huge role not just in um you know bringing attention to these people's individual cases but to um bringing attention to just what even has been happening in Iran. You know, these things were things that they would they were able to control in the past. They were able to um, do a lot of collateral damage with the narrative because um, how would you know unless you had access to social media? You're relying really on what your government tells you, what the news tells you. Um, so there's many ways to kind of deflect attention from that. Social media just changed the landscape of everything because it's direct. Yeah. It's videos I mean, I coming from inside Iran. Yeah, uh, and I, I want to bring up one specific example of the way v video, which you just mentioned, has seemed to change the way that this that things work in in revolutions or in pr protest movements, um, because something about this short form video being able to be you're able to take a snippet and then build on it, remix it, and then create a meme out of it that like spreads all over the place that that seems harder to 
control top down. And, and one example that I pulled here was uh, this gentleman uh, who uh, is named, I guess, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Sadeg Buhi. Uh, he is a, a, a store owner uh, who enjoys dancing and dancing in a way that apparently upsets the regime. So I want to play a little bit of that video of uh, Sadek dancing and then people emulating the dance. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what that means in the context of the Iranian regime. So let's roll that, John. So that's it's catchy. Dancing possibly should be a crime. No, <laughs> but it's but it's 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 really uh, fun and like nice to see like the vibrancy of uh, you know life there because you you can get kind of bogged down in the the horror that the regime is imposing on people, but seeing the the joy is really kind of beautiful. And there's some captions there that were provided by a, a nonprofit called the National Union for Democracy in Iran that explains some of the story there. But for our audio listeners especially, could you just explain the significance of this? No. Everything that we do, everything that the Iranian people do, it's really a form of protest. You know, joy is a f form of protest. It is mm. illegal to dance and sing in the streets of Iran. And so that's how they protest. And, and people, a lot of people don't realize that that's what they're doing when they do that. When they come out and they sing and they dance in the streets, they are, um, that's an act of resistance to them, right? Mm. Because they, they, they won't allow the regime to kill their joy. That's exactly why they make it illegal they make it illegal because they want people to be desperate despondent depressed sad because when you have people who are, are you know for all intents and purposes resigned they're much easier to um control and to subjugate so this is empowering and sadeg was arrested for doing that yeah yeah Oh, that's uh, re remarkable. What do you, how um, do you grapple yeah. with this bigger picture question of like social media is this extraordinary blessing because it allows this sort of like wonderful mimetic creative form to prosper, right? All of these people filming their forms of protest and being able to copy each other and also disseminating information about how brutal life is under the Islamic Republic to people just sitting on their couches or in their beds all over the world. So it has that incredible, revolutionary, extraordinary potential. But at the same time, you know, even your initial viral video that inspired us to reach out to you was a response to just vast um, what you view as totally false, completely wrong information that is also sort of being streamed into people's eyeballs all across the world and shaping public opinion. What do you make of this crazy double-edged sword and you know, do you have any sort of ruminations on this? Because the stakes are very high. I'm I'm so scared. I'm so scared about it because the way that social media is set up, not just um, the, the actors, but it's also the algorithm, which really, really f uh, favors like extremist rhetoric, unbalanced content. Um, mm. So, so what happens is that you get a bunch of people who are interested because something sparked off in the Middle East and they want to know about it, but they don't want to listen to a seven hour complicated discussion about the history and da da da, which I totally get. They just want like a two minute quick explanation. But the, the problem is there is no two minute quick, quick explanation because this is extremely complicated, extremely um, long history. So what happens is that when they do get those voices that do come out with a two minute summary of just like everything was fine before 1948, this happened, everyone was killed, like really extremist, really reductive voices. People all flock to that content because they're like, oh, this is where I learn. The algorithm um, favors that content. 
And so what happens is that you have these accounts that are um, posting this disinformation and they're reaching millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And I just fear, you know, this, this, we've not seen, we've not seen what the results of this generation are going to look like. Because if you think about it, what we grew up in, where we got our, our education from, everything that we learned was from school. Now, we can go back and forth about whether that's, you know, but it wasn't this, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. just complete, like masses of just like, unbelievably inaccurate, dangerous disinformation. And when you think about the things that we learned in school that actually were wrong, right? And um, the, the things that we later have learned to unpack, right? Like just take, for example, systemic racism, right? How long did it take us to unpack systemic racism in America? That was one small thing, right? I mean, it's not a small thing, it's a huge thing. There's one thing that we had to unpack. Um, now you're talking about how, how long is it going to to take to unpack millions of lies and disinformation that have come from social media that the the future generation are going to have a entirely warped perspective of everything but does does that give it too much credit right like on one hand people's consumption habits are such that you know they're they're downing these 2 minute videos the way they would down you know each individual chip in a bag of chips right like it's it's junk food for the spirit and for the mind sure but doesn't that also mean that it's forgettable and it's not something where they're actually particularly invested in it. And so there's a little bit of going in one year, going out the other. How many TikToks do people get exposed to where it's just kind of this forgettable thing that doesn't actually shape them in too deep of a manner? Are we giving them too much credit for being persuaded and deeply affected by what we are terming misinformation or disinformation? Well, I mean, I think you might be giving the, the audience a bit too much credit. Um, you, you're probably just projecting your own critical thinking onto them, which I don't think a lot of people have. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that... they're lazy and they don't give a shit. So I don't know if that's giving them credit, but... Well, I, I'll say that. I'll say that you might be right for um, a, a certain generations. I think that for, for, for Gen Z, the younger generations, I do think it actually shapes the way that they see the world. I think it does actually have a permanent effect. And you see that by the way that... The, yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's an effect in aggregate, right? Like the, to some degree, it's like, you know, how does that do your critical thinking skills atrophy the more that this becomes your default consumption method versus a longer form, more invested way of engaging with this material, right? Like that's something I worry about with my own child, for example. And is there, yeah. uh, have you noticed a difference between platforms? Like, is there mm -hmm. one that's particularly good or bad? I mean, TikTok's bad. Um, why? Hmm? why? Why? Um, I think TikTok's bad because um, it, I think that's a platform where a lot of radical voices become very go very very viral, and so um, any form of kind of like balance or nuance is very 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 offensive in the TikTok world. I think that's the place where you where you see a lot of the extremism go viral. I don't know if it's that much the case on Instagram. Um, Maybe this is all subjective. I've had much better experiences on t on Instagram. Um, t Twitter, I'd say, is the worst place for like uh, bots. You know, like oh. Russian bots and bots from um, from the regime. Um, it's just that place is just a, a hotbed for bots. Like anything that you post, you'll just get a stream of responses from like accounts that have like no profile picture and like one follow and like some crazy accusations like you work for Mossad and whatever whatever like mm. you know just it's just like how there's this zero do, do you regulation a, do, you, do you have a sense of how much penetration any of these platforms have within Iran itself because it is worth noting that I just this is a, a population pyramid of Iran and it skews the population skews younger much. than the United States the median age here is uh, 31. Uh, that's about seven years younger median age than the U.S. So G Gen Z is a huge portion of Iran's population. Um, is there a lot of social, do you, do you have a sense of if there's a lot of social media or uh, if any mm. of these platforms have particularly strong penetration into mm. the country? In Iranian terms, Zach is a boomer, which I kind of like. <laughs> I don't want to live in Iran, but I think that that would be a little fun. Yeah. I'm definitely on the, <laughs> the far end of that that uh, curve there. Um, you know, I I 
I think that the thing is that people, Iranian people, people inside Iran, they cannot um, use social media the way that we do. So there's really no mm -hmm. way of knowing. Um, but what I can tell you is that I receive messages from them um, yeah. all the time. People um, using I, VPNs and so forth, I assume. Exactly. I think that I think that there there is a lot of use of Twitter. I think there's a lot of use of Twitter um, for a lot more uh, political activity. But obviously, that's done with like like you said, VPNs, very discreet profiles, name changes, things like that. Um, but you know, it's really hard to know. I always found it uh, pretty perverse that uh, the Ayatollah had a Twitter account when yeah. the people are not allowed to. Um, that I, I don't know if he still does, but I remember uh, a few years ago he do, he does. Okay, I mean, there's something. There's really a lot of things. About that. He says a lot yeah. of things on Twitter. Like he'll literally just say, like, "We're going to wipe Israel off the map." Like it's Twitter's just a free for all, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Um, let's bring you, let's bring in, um, there's a, one more clip I wanted to play here, which was a recent exchange that you had with uh, Dave Smith, who we've had on the show before, and we've had both disagreements and agreement with him. You uh, Raise clashed your hand with if you've him. been personally victimized by Dave Smith. No, just kidding. <laughs> I, I deeply enjoy Dave. Yes. Uh, and we, uh, you, you recently clashed with him on Piers Morgan's show, uh, let's play a little bit of that and then talk about the root of that conflict in a little bit more relaxed format where you can explain the point you were trying to get to. Talk about the Houthis that are fighting for freedom. How dare you? How dare you not acknowledge what the Houthis are doing in Yemen? Do you, do you listen to Yemenis and their voices and what they have to say? They are being terrorized. They are being starved. They are being killed. A, a, a young Arabic woman is uh, uh, on death row right now in Yemen for criticizing the Houthis. I just think we have to have one standard here. And this is kind of the point I was getting to with national sovereignty. Like, let's if we're going to talk about things, let's have one standard. If our concern is over what's been happening to the people in Yemen, as you said, what the Houthis are doing to them. Do you know what's been happening to the people of Yemen over the last eight years? It's been the number one humanitarian crisis in the world, mm. in the war that Saudi Arabia launched on them with full backing from the United States of America. Okay, if you care about horrible things happening to the people of Yemen, then you better be criticizing Saudi Arabia and the United States of America. This war just ended yeah. over in, in the last year. The eight years That's previous to that were devastating. That's a what about to them. No, it's That's not. What about, no, 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 no. What about yeah, so what is what? No. Let me tell you okay, why. hold on, hold on. I'm not finished. No, 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 no. That, you said you weren't finished. No, you said you baptism. weren't finished before. I'm not finished now. What aboutism is a word that people yell when you call them out on their hypocrisy? I'm saying let's have one no, no, standard. No, absolutely not. I let's... can explain to you why it's a what aboutism. What, what, what about ism? What are we teenagers? What does this word even mean? I'm putting this into historical context. So that you understand, okay? A what aboutism deflects from the issue that was presented. The issue that I presented to you, okay, it's a logical fallacy. What I presented to you was the fact that the Yemeni people do not support the Houthis. And you you brought up, well, what about the fact that they don't support this and this? I didn't bring That's that into like no. By the way, I you. didn't. No, let me let me finish. Finish. Hold on, let's just be clear here. No, let me okay. explain so you understand. Well, let me finish. I'm not saying let that. Let me finish that's... my sentence. Oh, okay, go ahead. What I told you is that the Yemeni people have been vocal. If you would listen to their voices, you don't listen to their voices because they the radical and extremist voices are the ones that are propped up, okay, by the algorithm, by the media, and the people on the ground that are telling you they don't support the, the Houthis, okay. that's the people that don't support resistance. Listen, I'm not, uh, uh, certainly, I, I don't resistance. know exactly. I, I'm open to the idea that there are a lot of people in Yemen who do not support the Houthis. I'm not defending the way the Houthis treat their people. I'm not defending the way the Iranian government treats their people. What I'm saying is that if we're going to not be hypocrites here and we're criticizing them because we're concerned about how the people of Yemen are treated, where is this uh, criticism for the much bigger disaster that's been caused in that country over the last eight years? So I, I don't think you actually got a chance to reply to his last point there because of the format. It's tough being, you know, remote when everyone else there is in person. Is there anything uh, else you'd like to add to that argument or expand on your argument about what aboutism? Yeah, look, um, and this, um, the Yemeni people, I, I, there's certain accounts that I've also kind of shared on my Instagram as well. The, those Yemeni people have always been critical 
of, of, of every every form of oppression that they've experienced. This isn't the first time that they've come out and criticized, you know, the Houthis and the Houthis only. Um, the reason that I, I explained that that was a deflection is because he had previously said, or many people had previously said that the Houthis were heroes and the he uh, Houthis were fighting the good fight. And the mm -hmm. point that I made was that you cannot support um, the Houthis, when they are um, terrorizing the Yemeni people, the same way that you can't support the Islamic Republic when they're terrorizing the Iranian people. And his point was to turn around and say, well, what about the former Yemeni government? OK, if everything that you say about the former Yemeni government is true, blah, 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 blah. Does that mean that you now get to support the Houthis? No, it doesn't. And that's why it's a whataboutism, because nothing that you say changes the fact that you have no right to support them right now. Is, was Dave making an argument in favor or in support of the Houthis or calling them heroes? Or is he merely making an argument that says, well, if we're going to be consistent critics, we have to be, you know, paying attention to the role that Saudi Arabia and the United States have played in destabilizing Yemen? No, because we are. This isn't a conversation about us being critics. This isn't a conversation about us being critics of what's going on in Yemen. This is a conversation where they are introducing this concept that the uh, that the Houthis are doing something that we should all be supporting. So it's actually an attack against their premise to say that no, you shouldn't be supporting the Houthis because that is not what the people of Yemen are asking you to do. And then so introducing um, something else is 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 it's a red herring. It's a deflection to the fact that you the person who brought up support for the Houthis, this counter argument destroys your premise that we should be supporting the Houthis and your response is to deflect it to something else. That's what makes it a, a whataboutism. I, um, I follow the logic of your argument there. Um, I am curious, though, about what you think of Dave's other point, which is that Sometimes people who, uh, you know, when you're defending um, Israel or you're defending or you're criticizing the Houthis, that there can be a sort of myopic view of things, that uh, there's an unwillingness to look at what what contribution has the U.S., which is the government we live under, made to this situation, that we have to look at the fact that the U.S. backed Saudi Arabia's a campaign against Yemen is a real problem that doesn't really seem to get much attention. Like, like is is does he have a point that we really should be paying more attention to who we're supporting and, and what kinds of interventions um, we're, we're making and what the consequence of those interventions are? We have to follow the logic. We have to follow the logic. Um, so as I said, the Yemeni people do speak about that. You, what you're saying would absolutely be correct if, let's say, for example, no one had mentioned the Houthis and I just popped up and was like, guys, let me tell you about why the Houthis are so bad. You'd be absolutely right, right to be like, well, isn't that interesting that you haven't men mentioned X, Y, Z? And this is what's so critical because there has to be a proper analysis of what is the argument attacking. The initial premise is that was brought up is why the Houthis um, should be supported for this. And it was an attack against that. Now, if you start to go into other things that should also be um, uh, criticized, Yes, they should also be criticized. It doesn't respond to the argument. So something that doesn't respond to the um, argument is a deflection, right? And, and that's the point that's being made. Many things can be true at the same time. Nobody is saying that we shouldn't criticize that. It's you who brought up the po point of who we have to support. And this is exactly what they complain about in the other direction, right? When people speak about what's going on in Gaza, um, a, a, a legitimate, a legitimate response is, why aren't we talking about the biggest genocide happening in the world right now, which is in Darfur? Why aren't we talking about Syria? Why aren't we talking about what is happening in Iran? And they get very upset when you say that, but it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate point, right? Why aren't we talking about those things? And then the pro-Israel side is going to say, well, that's because of anti-Semitism. That's because of no Jews, no news. You know, there are multiple things that can be true at the same time. But what is important is that you are responding to the premise that has been introduced. The premise introduced was support for the Houthis and the response was to attack that premise. No bearing on anything else that's ever happened in Yemen. And of course, those are all things that we can and should be criticizing when they come up on their own. I, I'm, I'm, mis oh, sorry, I'm misunderstanding what the precipitating thing on the Pierce Morgan show was. 
You're saying that Dave, Dave basically brought up something that was sort of tangential. No, Dave brought up something in support of the Houthis. I, I can't remember exactly. It was it was a long conversation. It was like 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he actively said something in support of the Houthis. I don't know if it was him or somebody else, but there was some mention of how the Houthis were doing a, a good thing as part of this. I, I don't know. I don't know. It was, no. it was something along that line. Well, I mean, Dave Stick is criticizing American empire, right? And... You know, I think that there's a lot of validity to that and a lot of, I mean, there's a reason why he does that. I mean, his audience is predominantly American and there's a sense of, you know, how do we dial back American foreign interventionism? And I think it's totally fine to engage with that and to say, you know, we we come to different conclusions as to um, the necessity of that. But I mean, I think Dave does a good job of turning people's attention toward the fact that the Houthis didn't just pop up out of nowhere um, and that if we're speaking to an American audience, they should be considering, is this what we want our taxpayer dollars? Um, do we want our taxpayer dollars uh, aiding what Saudi Arabia is doing? And when that indirectly does end up introducing this amount of conflict in Yemen and destabilizing an already unstable region, what do you make of that sort of the, the you know, Dave's bigger picture, um, the thing that animates him of trying to roll back American foreign interventionism? Well, if you said that, you know, that would have been a good argument. That isn't what he said, though. That was uh, a, 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 an inappropriate rebuttal to what I said. It was a deflection to what um, what was actually being introduced. That bringing up that on its own is a perfectly valid argument. I also, it, what concerns me, what concerns me, which is what a lot, a lot of um, Americans often tend to do, because um, I, I've, I'm, I'm, I've spent my life as a Middle Eastern woman criticizing the West's role in the Middle East and, and, in, and in different countries. But what I find that a lot of American people tend to do is that they hyper-focus on um, criticism of the West to the extent that they almost give a pass to these like um, terrorist regimes uh, or fundamentalist groups. And they say, oh, well, this is all because of Western um, um, intervention. This is all because the West propped them up. Yeah, the West propped them up, but they existed long before the West propped them up. And this is not like it's actually to me very racist. It's very racist that there's this implication. It's a self-absorbed way of looking it's at it. It's so you know. Western centric. It's right. so Western centric that like nothing bad would happen in the world if the most important people in the world, aka the West, weren't uh, actively making things happen. Yeah, the I mean, I, I agree with I agree with the that critique, uh, and I, I think we touched on that earlier. But um, I think w one thing that we need to contend with is what should the U.S. be doing? Because when I look at the history of what's happened to Iran, we talked about Mossadegh earlier. You know, in the fifties, they had a democratic Iran had a demo, this democratically elected leader who was a nationalist. He was accused by the US and UK at the time of being sympathetic to the communists, even though he really wasn't. Um, but he was trying to nationalize the oil, which upset the British uh, oil interests there. And it's pretty openly acknowledged now that the, the British uh, intelligence and the US intelligence worked together to overthrow that regime. And from my historic, from my perspective, that set in motion a series of events that led to the rise of Islamic radicalism in uh, Iran. A am I wrong to look at the history that way? And if so, what am I missing? Yeah, it did. It didn't lead to the rise of radicalism. The radicalism was there. There's been different instances where these things have helped empower. Um, or, or exaggerate the radicalism. And that's that's the thing that um, people really, you know, when, when you even just look at the history of the Middle East and how, like, you go back to um, even just how uh, the seventh century Muslim conquests all around the Middle East and North Africa um, region, this wasn't, uh, you know, people didn't go around and say, hi, please, can you um, just um, become um, Muslim or Arabic? Of course, this was all done by... Um, it's was colonialism. It's imperialism. We have a long history of our own, our, our own colonialism and imperialism. We had the the Arab slave trade that lasted for lasted for thirteen hundred years. We had many many um, uh, uh, radical groups 
Islamist fundamentalists. But I think that the main issue is, the main issue for me that I really struggle with is this overcorrection. There was this period of time where there was an acknowledgement of a Western interference in the West that people openly acknowledged, okay, this was a bad thing. We've been telling you this was a bad thing, right? And then the overcorrection was, okay, so what we should be doing instead is a diplomacy with these, um, with these extremely pr problematic regimes. And so what I say in response to your question of what the West should be doing, and, and this is one of my favorite quotes to respond to things like that, is that if I wanted to get there, I wouldn't have started here. We're in a situation now where the West has empowered, first of all, helped bring, introduce the um, Ayatollah to, to Iran, bring in this Islamic Republic. For the past 45 years, they've been engaging in diplomatic relations with this regime to kind of mm -hmm. counteract the whole history of like, oh, okay, we're not going to do any uh, of these military interventions anymore. What we're going to do instead is do um, diplomacy with these regimes. They've now uplifted the regime. And it to me, this is just Western imperialism all over again. It's just different permutations, different faces of Western imperialism. But don't don't we need? I mean, isn't is aren't the options essentially diplomacy or war? I mean, there is a contingent no. of uh, politicians here in the U.S. who've wanted war with Iran for a long, long time. John McCain, bomb, 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 bomb Iran. John Bolton is talking about uh, that we need to strike Iran. Trump pulled us out of the Iran deal, which I heard you, you were critical of the Iran deal earlier, but like the reality yeah. is that I've pulled up a, I've pulled up a um, chart from the Institute for uh, Science and International Security that shows these two red lines. No, nuclear when the Iran nuclear deal took effect, they did stop enriching nuclear materials at the level that they would need to make nuclear weapons. And once Trump pulled us out of that deal, they started making enriching nuclear material again. So isn't backing away not, from not. diplomacy just a path to direct confrontation or war with Iran? No, that, that's Islamic Republic propaganda. First of all, um, German re uh, intelligence reports actually revealed that, that they were cheating um, during the um, JCPOA. They were not adhering the way that um, Obama had claimed that they were. Um, the second thing is that um, the JCPOA was replete with sunset provisions that ended within like a 10, 15 year period. So what they had actually done is unleashed $150 billion to the regime and then they, with a temporary restriction on their um, nuclear acceleration. After that period of time has passed, they, they're now this much richer and they have the opportunity. They were just kicking the can down the road. And that is so dangerous. It was there, so there's dangerous. Been a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, claims and counterclaims about whether or not and to what extent they were adhering to that deal. And I would think that the proper course of action would be to prove that case and then say, OK, this deal is no longer valid instead of kind of unilaterally pulling out of the deal because... I don't know if Trump didn't like it's terrible, that. It was that a deal. terrible idea. I think the Iranian community and everyone has, has come out and open, openly acknowledged that this was a terrible idea. 45 years of diplomacy with this regime was a terrible idea. So when you come to where we are now, where you say things like, OK, well, the only option we have now is war. That's because of you. That's because of you, that you've been empowering them for 45 years. We, the Iranian people, have given you options over and over and over and over again of what you could have done, okay? Stop with these um, nuclear deals, stop with these trade agreements. Um, I mean, G Germany's trade agreements with with Iran are just absolutely insane. What do you stop mean by with that? the hostage stop diplomacy. With the, stop with the trade agreements, what do you mean? It, I mean, the Europe, the UK, the US, um, Western governments are, have been doing business, doing, like it just they've been empowering the regime in various ways for the past 45 years what should have happened from the beginning is an isolation tactic like an isolation technique where there's I mean, no like hmm? i mean i mean doesn't this end up hurting uh you know willing buyers and sellers on both sides of the deal yeah, I mean, and embargo san san sanctions what tend to sanctions? fall on the the population right sanctions do but if they are um, not inconsistently. This, this, this is what hurts the po population, where you do some sanctions here and you don't really... 
if you're going to do something to take out the regime, right, you have to go the whole way. You've got, got to go the whole way. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you, you put a little bit sanctions here. You cripple the economy. It's not quite enough to take out the regime. The people are suffering. It's just, it's, it's, it's do we have examples of that working, though? I mean, it seems like embargoes and sanctions even applied in a very draconian, intense manner with coordination from an awful lot of Western countries. Do it doesn't result in regimes necessarily ending. It results in an incredible yeah, no, amount it does. of and, and, it, 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 it also tends to result in an escalation of hostilities and is a kind of precursor to war, uh, historically speaking, right? I mean... During the time that they had the, um, the 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 maximum pressure campaign, the regime was really on its knees. It really was on its knees. There are many 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 points that um, because because they cannot deal with internal contradictions and external contradictions at the same time. There have been many many times that this regime has been brought to its knees, and right at that turning point is the exact time that the U.S. decides to um, unleash billions of billions more. Um, to engage in more diplomatic relations with them, it's it's they're not giving the Iranian people a chance. This has been like discussed so many times. There's so many books. There's so many things that report on this. Okay, um, I th we could we could go on for probably a while talking about uh, what U.S. foreign policy should be, but uh, we need to wrap up the conversation. So I want to leave you with the last word, Elika. Um, what would you say? That America, that Americans, Westerners, especially these folks that you've interacted with on social media, people who would seemingly be sensitive to the plight of oppressed people, at least that's what their rhetoric would indicate. What do, would you say are some resources or where should they look to better educate themselves and understand what is happening in Iran? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I mean, one account to follow is Nifty, the one that you put up. Um, that's um, a good account that um, reports on kind of what's happening inside Iran, what's happening outside Iran. Um, I I mean, I could come up with many, many, many accounts, um, but you've put me on the spot, so I have to go that, and that, think. That's about. okay. I mean, maybe it's a broader question is just um, if you could, you know, sit down with one of these misguided activists for an hour or, or, for, for a couple minutes, like, what would you say to them? Um, what would you say about how they should, how kind of the typical, I don't know, progressive activist should change how they think about the situation? You no, know, and I think that's really, really what the problem is, is that you, you cannot... You cannot do that in a couple of minutes. And that and that's, I think, exactly why we are where we are, because they've built their perception of this over time. And deconstructing their perception of this is going to take time. It's going to take a lot of um, re kind of framing, reframing their perspective on um, all of this, on the West, on the East. Um, and that's kind of what we seek a lot of uh, us Iranians, activists, what we seek to do is we try to do this kind of educational explanation. And unfortunately, you really aren't going to get it in a, a few minute soundbite. You're, you really have to rewire and reconstruct the way that you understand this, not through the, the prism of a Western lens, you know, um, I, I, I can't offer it in a few minutes. I really can't. It's yeah. just there's well, going to have to be an investment on how yeah. the Iranian people see it. And that's going to that's going to take time. Well, I'll offer this as one path towards that, which is to follow Elika Laban on all of her social accounts, <laughs> whether you're on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, she's on all of them. Uh, and we've really appreciated you joining us for the conversation today. You uh, certainly enlightened us and it was a, a lively and I think really fruitful discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, we'll be back here same time next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.